The key issue is whether we're teachable or not. We have to continually adapt. The world we live in now is really changing faster than it ever has. So it requires adaptation even more so. So is success something you arrive at or is it something else? It's a pathway. You can stay on that pathway as long as you want to. Some people get a certain amount of success or a certain amount of wisdom and they feel, well, this is serving me. I'm satisfied here. Often that leads to degeneration. What's been your path, Martin? You're listening to another episode of Success with Purpose, where we hold conversations with the most holistically successful people we have the opportunity to connect with. We explore their journeys, their life-changing events, their perspectives, their mindset, and most importantly, their purpose. I'm Harry Goldberg, host, interviewer, and interrogator of this podcast. Father of the most incredible daughter in the world, husband of an incredible woman, and director and empowerment coach at Purpose Advisory. Hope you enjoy this episode, and don't forget to subscribe and like below. Now, let's begin. Before we dive into this journey, Martin, how do you define success? Success for me is being able to sustainably live a fulfilling life across sort of the different important sectors of our life. And um, obviously, we want to do something purposeful uh, creatively or in business or in some sort of productive environment because we're just wired that way. We're wired to to um, want to make an increase in the world. And so being able to find a way to do that that's healthy and sustainable and rewarding is is amazing. And, and often that takes a bit of a, a journey to arrive at. We don't just sort of get sort of kicked out of the end of school and suddenly we can just step right into that. There's a journey into finding your own, um, uh, finding the sort of purposeful uh, activities that, that are in alignment with who you feel that you are and, and probably in alignment with your natural abilities, things that come sort of easily and feel very fulfilling when we're doing them. So there's that aspect. And I think along with that, for it to be sustainable, you need to have a um, support base of relationships with people close to you, but also I think we're, with mentors of some sort. Um, and that could be, that could come through the media, it could be through books you read, or it could be actual relationships with with um, people who you've come to know or people that you connect with sort of professionally. You seek out some sort of mentoring and, and you connect in that way. But for success to be sustainable, we need really wisdom. Wisdom to me is, the, is sort of the core element, which is sort of um, having a tool set of perspectives and practices that just deliver fulfillment across those different areas of your life and and then just r being able to continue to upgrade yourself across those perspectives and tools so seeking to have ongoing development in those areas there's something interesting which you yes. raised there and that was uh you mentioned earlier on that it takes a while to arrive at this uh, definition of success or yes. arrive at the part where you can where you can have harmony and there's a journey to yes, get there absolutely. and then you just said something which is saying that you have always got to continue to grow and improve and uh, continue to accumulate more tools and perspectives yes. and have mentors and relationships that can continue to deliver the fulfillment yeah. across the different areas of your life so is success something you arrive at or is it something oh, it's else it's a pathway it's definitely a pathway that you enter onto and and you can stay on that pathway you know as long as you want to i mean some people get a certain amount of success or a certain amount of wisdom and they feel well this is serving me you know i'm just sort of going to turn that function off or I'll let that function diminish i'm satisfied here and um and so and then often that leads to um degeneration you know things life where things are stagnant and not growing, it tends things tend to to degenerate, and um, we have to continually. Ad I believe we have to continually adapt, and I, I think part of that is is particularly the world we live in now is really um, changing 
are very, um, what's the word, changing faster than it ever has. So it requires adaptation uh, even more so. The ability to adapt is a really key part of sort of a wisdom tool set. Yeah, okay. And we'll, we'll definitely touch on that, how, how all of this applies to within our lives. Yeah. Uh, but beyond, before we get there, I'm curious as well, because you use, you've used two key words quite a few times throughout your uh, description of success yes. just now. You use the term sustainable or sustainably yes. and fulfilled or fulfilling. Yes. So do you want to explain a bit more about what those mean? Well, I mean, often the problem often is with when we see success as sort of a de destination we arrive at, what then happens is the very things that we that got us to the place of getting some rewards and getting some recognition or whatever it is that we're seeking, we often then, if we see it as a destination, we stop doing the things that actually got us there. And we sort of sit back and feel, okay, yeah, I've made it. I don't need to continue to be in this state of sort of humility and, and teachability, whereby we continue to be aware of ways that we can be doing things uh, that are, that are going to incrementally make things better. You know, in terms of our own attitude, in terms of our ability to perceive um, what's really going on in, in situations and the ability to be able to perceive what's really going on inside of ourself. And those are the sort of skills that make the success or that sense of fulfillment sustainable. Is that making sense? Okay. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And so I'm, I'm just curious then. The, the first thing that my mind jumps to is, let's say, like a really stereotypical example. You've got a, a woman who dedicated her life, so sort of kind of working, but then also dedicating most of her life to her kids. Yes. Her kids are all now old. They've, they've all gone to university. They've grown up. They're married. They've got kids. They've moved out. And that, that woman's sense of purpose or everything that she was working hard to achieve is now kind of yes. done. It's kind of got to a point where it's done. And then this, this happens a lot of mm. the time, especially when I used to work with retirees. Yes or pre-retirees are like, ah, I don't want to stop working because then, then like, what have I got to live for? Am I just going to play golf and just do yeah. nothing for the rest of my life? And so what happens when people get there or what leads people to that circumstance or that situation? And how have you seen people really successfully kind of snap out of it and continue to move forward, even when like the core meaning in their life or their core purpose that they've defined has is no longer a, poor, a core purpose or is no longer necessary. Yeah, I think one of the aspects of that is, is that when people attach their sort of core sense of purpose to very specific goals, like, um, yeah, let's say take that example of a mother raising some children and she's got this amazing sense of purpose and fulfillment in providing the environment for her children to thrive and to grow. That's incredibly powerful and incredibly fulfilling. And it's connected with her whole emotion and hormonal system. A woman's whole um, physiology is set up to feel incredibly fulfilled doing, you know, doing raising children because women who didn't have that, you know, their children tended not to survive. And so what we've, women today carry all that connection to feeling fulfillment and raising children and doing a really great job of it and so you're right and but the difficulty is is if we overly connect our sense of purpose to specific goals what happens is when um, those goals are fulfilled the sense of purpose drops away so I think that what often people fall for is that they don't make their sense of purpose universal enough they don't ha have they don't build a sort of core philosophy that can work for them for their whole life they tend to attach it to sort of visible specific things and then the, the trap is with that is once those are fulfilled the sense of purpose and fulfillment drops away so if a lot of people are listening to this and they're most people who are listening i imagine are in their 30s plus or minus a few years sure. and most of them are, most of them are very much focused on their uh, on their career and what they can achieve and maybe with their kids or starting a family or whatever it is. Th those are the those are the core parts which they're focused on. Yes. What, I, what I'd love them to be able to receive from this conversation is at least one of the things 
is how to avoid falling into that trap, mm. how to avoid falling in the trap in another 30 or 40 years, your your sense of purpose attached to those goals isn't necessary isn't doesn't exist anymore mm. because those goals are already achieved. Yeah. So how can we maybe put it another way, how can we define more empowering and more fulfilling goals which lead to greater success in the long run whereby we never actually get there we just love getting there. Yeah, I guess I guess that's um as children um and young people our picture of the world is very limited and and so it's totally um natural for us in those stages of our life to to attach ourselves to specific um you know goals and objectives but what happens is as we sort of get into our 20s and we sort of go out into the world and meet a whole range of um people from all sorts of cultures uh and with different world views um we get and our brain expands to sort of be able to take all of that in, there's this opportunity, and I think this carries on for the rest of our adult life, but it, it particularly shows up in our 20s and probably early 30s, because our brain is still being, um, isn't fully developed really until our late 20s. So there's this process whereby the whole sort of adult world is opening up, and there's this opportunity to to sort of arrive at um, more abstract universal ideas and sort of philosophies because we've had enough experience to see that there are all sorts of people, there's all sorts of cultures, there's all sorts of ways of seeing the world and we've had relationships with a certain number of them and we see that there, there are choices, there are options in front of us and how we want to see ourselves, how we want to see the world, how we want to engage with the world. and there's an opportunity to sort of create a sort of core philosophy that can manage all of that complexity by by sort of seeing things in a more universal way and arrive at these sort of core beliefs and and um, apply into our um, work environment and into um, whatever we're doing creatively or productively and also we can apply that into our relationships and often people are so busy just doing all the tasks inside of those sort of short-term goals and there's always another short-term goal ahead that they sort of miss that opportunity and they may well you know be successful in fulfilling those short-term goals but along the way they don't gather the wisdom whereby they arrive at a set of sort of universal principles to live by okay so so at what point do we decide, I'm guessing this is something we do all the time, but at what point are we able to identify that something is a short-term goal rather than being part of our broader meaning and purpose in life? How do you differentiate between those two and how do you find ways that they work together? Time is the sort of magical factor in all of this. And in a sense, you could the, the sort of simplest way to arrive at this is to sort of look at yourself and consider if you were at, the end of your life, it's sort of in the later stages of your life, and you were looking back on your life, how would you like your life to have looked overall? And and in a sense, in doing that, you step out of sort of being trapped in the time zone of the sort of present and the short term, and you and you actually put yourself into a place where you can consider your life as a whole. And then in that, place you're far more likely to see things in a more universal way and a more sort of broad principles way rather than just being limited to specific achievements or specific goals yeah i love that uh i think tony robin calls that the rocking chair yeah test. yeah right that's such when a you're, great right, when you're like when you're 85 years old and you're sitting on your front yes. porch on your rocking chair watching the world go by what would have what would you have to have done between your current age and eighty five to have made your life a great yeah. life? And I, I love that you've raised that already as well. Okay, and so that that's powerful. Mm. That's a powerful approach to take. But then people say, okay, fine. So those are the things which would make a great life. But I still have a mortgage to pay, and I've still got kids to raise, and I've still got I've, I'm still trapped with how much time I have and what I can actually do. What would be your response to that? I guess the response is, is that what we have to do is sort of incrementally work our way towards where we want to go. I, 
usually use a framework around uh, three to five years in terms of where would I love to be in five years? What would I like my life to look like? And five years is sort of far enough out. If we're um, diligent and, and are willing to do the work, we can transform aspects of our life. And, and transforms aspects of who we are in terms of the practices we do and, and uh, our um, personal growth. And I think that's a really useful time frame as well. It's not too far out to feel like, oh, that's be way beyond where I am. It's sort of close enough to feel like that's reachable, but far enough out to give me the space to do the work to bring about the change that I'd like to happen. Yeah. No, and that's... That's cool. I, I recognize that and, re and respect it. I really do. And I guess that the reason why most people struggle to do it is because they're busy living life looking in the rearview mirror. Yeah. Right? Like they're saying, oh, but I haven't done anything in the last five years. The next five years are going to be exactly the same. Is that the, is that the main kind of resistance you get to that type of activity? No, I think people love to do that, to be honest. Okay. It feels, mm -hmm. it's just like when I'm doing an exercise like that with a client, it's just creating the space for them to not feel they don't have to feel at all attached to what to what they're sort of creating in terms of a vision of how they'd like their life to be and so i create that space for them so they're freed up from all present limitations and they can sort of freely um, start to in a sense look within themselves and see what it is that they really desire in terms of when we free ourselves from all our current limitations and create this um, unlimited possibility in the future, what tends to, sh we get a chance to sort of look in the mirror and so see who we really are, not who we are defined by our circumstances and our background. And there's something really powerful about when people can see who they really are and what their strengths and what their deepest desires are, there's, that, there's this opportunity to connect with that part of themselves and start to believe in that part of themselves and start to believe that might even be possible. And that's mm. incredibly powerful. And then it's just it a matter of breaking that down into a set of steps, into increments, which is how we get somewhere. It's a number of taking a number of steps along the way. Mm. And, and now from people I've spoken to, a lot of time, let's just say they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and they're saying, well, what, what's even the point of setting a five-year or ten, we talk about in 10 years usually, but a five-year or 10-year goal what, what's even what's even the point there? Because you know something like COVID could happen, and then you're out of your job, or you could have an unexpected pregnancy, or thing, or it might take longer to get pregnant than you wanted to, and yes. those were the milestones. So why bother setting steps out for so far into the future if we're not even necessarily able to get there because there are so many uncontrollables? What's your response to it? The fact is, is that we what's so powerful about it is, is that through an exercise like that we get to see who we are and we get to be empowered by a sense of wow i'm a person who actually wants to do something significant with my life that's who i actually yeah. am and in a sense there's this opportunity to find a sense of self-appreciation and self-respect and change of of sort of present current circumstances does, doesn't take that away all we have to do is just adapt the specifics the still core truth about who we are as someone who's wanting to do something something positive, something um, significant in some way, doesn't pass just because, you know, some of our present circumstances change. We find if, if we're connected to that sense of purpose and to that sense of um, self-appreciation, within that is the determination to find a way to make it happen. And there's a within it, there's a belief that that I'll I'll do whatever it takes to to get past whatever ob obstacles that come in my way. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And so then you're mentioning about who we are and you, you've mentioned that, uh, or you've implied that everyone wants to do, everyone's core identity is someone who wants to do something positive and something significant. Yes. Are, are we all entirely individuals? Are we, do we all have common identity? How, how do you perceive the difference between our individual or in terms of our individuality and then a sense of collective purpose and collective identity yeah yeah no the thing is is that what one person sees as significant or positive isn't the same as what others that's what that's what's so amazing about humanity in a sense we have these sort of 
core drives that you know are totally measurable across it seems pretty much every everybody who's in a sort of reasonably healthy mental state there's certainly outliers uh, who you know who have serious dysfunction that you know have through circumstances or, or their background haven't been able to connect with those positive desires and and drive towards wanting to you know add something into the world and that sense of fulfillment that comes with that so yeah we've we've got i believe yeah we've got these universal drives um but how we express and see those really varies individually. And also there's a lot of variation culturally we, and familiarly, like our family background has a set of values that we tend to take on, you know, at least some aspects of that. And our culture is, is, has got all these underlying values that we'll tend to absorb at least some of. And that will shape, that will shape us because we want to be accepted inside our family. We want to be accepted inside uh, our society. We don't want to be a out, you know, total outlier. And so, so that sort of causes us to conform along certain lines. But in a free society like what we live in largely, now there's just so many different ways to express that and probably right now there's more ways than there ever has because that's the nature of our culture is it's incredibly um, complex culturally because we've taken in all these cultures from all over the world and all these influences and created this sort of tapestry of human sort of international culture that provides an opportunity yeah, for incredibly diverse individual expression. So this is awesome because now, now you're talking about is yes, you're you're raised with within your own culture, mm -hmm. and then you're raised in the broader culture outside of those who are like you. Yes, and then you also have some sense of personality which already makes you a little yeah. bit different. But then, as a result of that, you're making different decisions, and then you've got your yes. own journey. And then your own life journey starts to define who you are along with all of your environmental, other environmental factors like the culture and the people you go to school with, the people you see at family mm -hmm. events, the people you go to university with, the people you go to work with and who you meet there. And ultimately that defines uh, your beliefs and your perspective and who yeah. you are. And so then if we take that a step further, we say that your identity and your purpose lies in your own unique experience. Yeah as opposed to anything else. Yeah, and it's taken on influences, you know, from uh, even, in, there's so much of it is it actually comes from the whole history of humanity and the way we've evolved and the way human societies evolved. And we're born with a yeah. lot of that, like uh, the way we respond to certain things. Um, it's it's sort of wired and programmed into us, a lot of it, yeah. yeah. And, and that helps okay. make us all have this sort of universal connections as well. Because, you know, at a core level, the way our brain, our emotions, our physicality, we, we have a lot of shared connections. Yes. But the beautiful thing is, is that within humans, we, we've, with language um, and culture, we're able to then sort of create our own journey inside of that beautiful, complex world of sort of the natural world and 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 the human sort of cultural world and we we get to choose our path through that and so what's been your path martin like i, I obviously gave it a little bit of an intro yeah but go back as far as you like you can go back to when you started working or university or school or childhood it's completely up to you but what's been what's been your journey to ultimately get to you to where you are today i guess my my journey what's i feel like i'm very just extremely fortunate I mean, I grew up in a in a very small town in New Zealand, country town in New Zealand, at a time um, in the sort of post-war sort of boom time in New Zealand. Um, the town was really prosperous, it was surrounded by quite rich farmland. And my father was the local lawyer in this very cute little town, it had this sort of town square with a clock tower right in the middle, and everything was orderly. And this was before television had arrived in New Zealand. So this is, this is in the late 50s and early 60s. And yeah, wow. it was just this incredibly harmonious little community. And so I've seen the world change from sort of pre-television, like telephone was, and radio were the technologies. And I've seen it, the culture change as television came in television came in and really changed our culture 
and I've seen it flow right through to where we are now. And so I've been, I guess, blessed enough to experience all those different cultural changes. But my my personal experience was is my parents were these really very moral, upright people who um, my mum was a school teacher and both of my parents were, yeah, really highly respected in the small community. And I had three siblings but i was sort of the black sheep i was this kid who even though my life was so orderly and so surrounded by goodness i chose to just rebel against it to the point that by the age of 14 i was um selling methamphetamine it sounds it sounds sort of crazy and unbelievable but that's that's um what ended up happening the thing that had happened in the end in the middle was is that I'd been sent off to boarding school. My parents wanted me to get the best possible education. And I was this sort of very creative, arty sort of kid. I loved reading and I wasn't sporty. And this all-male boarding school was this really militaristic sort of place that I just didn't fit into at all. And also I was very young and my parents had sort of pushed me ahead at school. And so this sort of sort of quite aggressive male world and this sort of, I guess, fairly sensitive sort of arty kid, it just, I just didn't fit there at all and I hated it. And I, I, I was there for two years and I came out of that sort of really disconnected from my family, even though I'd had a really great relationship prior. Once I got out of that boarding school, I really um, had felt abandoned and I felt really angry against my family, my parents. And so once I went to high school, I just connected with the worst elements of society. I ended up sort of having, getting to know some of the local bikies and I ended up selling methamphetamine. They used to get shipments in from the Hells Angels in in Los Angeles. And, and, and I used to sell some of these, uh, some of this methamphetamine to the kids at my school, but also at the same time, my schoolwork was go, totally going backwards. And, and over the next four years from when I was 14 through to when I was 18, I just developed really sort of heavy drug addictions that were really damaging. So by the time of 18, I had an experience, a full sort of psychosis experience from just abuse of, of um, psychedelic drugs. And I think also I had a sort of personality disorder that had developed just from all this anger that I had inside of me. And so, yeah, by the time I was 18, it was, I'd sort of gone down this terrible pathway and to the point that very much I nearly died. And it was really only sort of through miraculous circumstances that I came out of that. But when I did, I just really needed a sense of purpose in my life that was positive. And after that, I went off to art school and I studied art and design, and I saw that as a way of contri- doing something really positive because I just, this really self-indulgent um, sort of rebelliousness um, ha- had really, and, and where it had led me, had really shocked me and forced me to want to find a really powerful sense of life purpose that would um, get me out of this depression and out of all this um, self-loathing that I'd had. So for me, it was really quite extreme. And and that extreme experience meant I needed to find something really strong, some, you know, belief system and understandings about life so that I could manage my own um, dysfunction, really. And so really, ever since I was 18, I've just been on this path to want to um, find a way to live really connected with a sense of purpose that's really fulfilling and I mean I've made all these you know wrong turns along the past because I've been trying to learn this it's been incredibly fulfilling just being on that path of seeking wisdom and and inevitably along the way finding bits of wisdom and putting it together and trying to live by it and and then seeing you know being able to find this beautiful woman who's my wife and and raise three kids and 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 having an amazing um, relationship with them and running a business with them for 10 years and just having a most um, incredibly and rich life in, in every possible way, really. I'm curious about something you shared, whereby you said, use the term, you're on a terrible yeah. path. And then you also said you've made wrong turns on yes. your path. 
but then ultimately we only get to where we are through all the experiences and the turns yeah. and the and decisions we've made. Do you believe that there are terrible decisions and that there are terrible paths to go down? Or are they all part of an ultimate journey which we're on and we're going to get there one way or another and so therefore it is what it is? Yeah, I think the thing is is that the key issue is whether we're teachable or not. We can make, you know, bad decisions and end up in circumstances that are difficult and painful and hurtful to others and so on. But as long as we're teachable, you know, there'll be a point where we go, nah, this is not the way I want to go. Or, you know, what can I learn from this? You know, how did I allow myself to get entangled in this? And what can I do to prevent myself from falling into that particular trap? And, you know, how can I educate myself to, to, to be more perceptive? How can I, um, who can I um, seek wisdom from and, and so on. It's just this path of, of really just being teachable and open to learning from our experience. Okay, and so that's, it sounds like, if I'm hearing you correctly, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what mistakes you make as long as you're willing to learn from those mistakes. Yeah. I, I think so. I mean, the part of learning from those mistakes is seeking to prevent, um, you know, falling into you know, actively learning in terms of applying what we learn. It's not enough to go, oh, I know what happened there, and and then fall into the same trap in a slightly different way. We need to, we sort of need to, um, yeah, we need to develop sort of discernment whereby we can sort of see similar patterns and go, oh, okay, it's not quite the same uh, trap as before, but I see similarity, so I'm going to be really careful around that and um, go into it with eyes open and make sure I've got a way out of it if that's if that's the path. Okay, so let, let's continue with your journey. And so you you finally kind of got yourself. Uh, by the way, how, how did that how did that snap out? You had psychosis, and then you said it was just very fortunate you ended up somehow being able to get back on the right track. What uh, what happened at that eighteen? Was what really happened is I had this sort of in a sense, um, a sort of almost miraculous experience. I, you know, I can never understand how it happened, but I sort of reached, I'd, I'd say it was, um, looking back, I sort of see that it was like a spiritual type experience. I, I didn't perceive it as that at the time, but I was just in this incredibly um, disconnected and psychotic state. And I sort of, I didn't know where to turn. I didn't have any sort of spiritual beliefs, but I, I just had this amazing experience of this of me sort of crying out for help in a sense, not not out loud, but inside of myself. I just got so despaired that I cried out for help in my heart I, and in my mind. Then the next moment, I sort of had this incredible feeling of sort of peace and freedom come over me, and the whole of the psychosis sort of lifted and I was in the state of what just happened. <laughs> I, mm. I, and, and this psychosis had been going on for days and I, I, and I was getting more and more despaired about it and to the point that I really sort of cried out for help. And this incredible peace came over me. And what was amazing is, is this clarity of mind came with it and uh, which I hadn't had for years because of all the drug use. And I just felt free of what had gone before. I didn't understand where it had come from or what it was. But I did sort of go looking. I thought, well, gee, if I can have such a beautiful experience with no drugs involved, that was more ultimate than anything that I'd ever experienced uh, on psychedelics or drugs of any kind. I sort of thought, well, there must be something outside of that that sort of chemical induced experience that's even more ultimately ultimate than what i've experienced in there so i sort of went looking for the source of that and that was really the i know in a sense i'm still on that journey that's is connecting with that sense of incredible um sort of i guess love peace joy fulfillment and pretty much from that point from 18 on i've stayed away from drugs because in a sense yeah the biggest buzz I ever ever got was outside of that experience where before I was really trapped I was quite really quite addicted to the the experiences that I'd had 
uh, and but that just broke it because it was so much more ultimate and and so really I wanted to find a way to live in harmony with that sort of experience mm. and so I've, I'm thinking immediately to some friends and mentors uh, who have very opposing views on this topic yes uh, on the one side I'll give the most extreme is someone who was a monk for 10 years wow. as a result yes. of an experience where they, were, they weren't addicted to drugs, they were addicted to uh, a whole bunch of other things such as how much money they can make or how to yeah. succeed in the world yeah. and what they could possibly do and GFC hit and he ended up just having absolutely nothing and then he was in a sense of euphoria for a few weeks. Oh, wow. And like, how, does that, how does that make sense? I don't have what I was working so hard to achieve and then suddenly I'm blissful, right? And he went on to be a monk in a uh, Hindu temple in Hawaii oh, wow. for 10 years. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And he's back in the world now, but he, he doesn't need drugs to have the sense mm. of stillness and peace. I've got another friend who's been quite successful and very determined, also similar age to myself, uh, in, and in terms of what he's able to focus on and what he can do. But he also wants to lead a very spiritual path. And he's been doing that and doing all the right work for it, meditation, all of it but where he really finds the most stillness and most peace in a holistic way, which actually changes his life yes. and contributes to it is through psychedelics such as ayahuasca and a whole bunch of others. And so I'm curious how you reconcile the difference between these, because obviously like you have people who can do it without, and you have people who can, who, who find it so much easier with, and yes, ayahuasca is very different to meth. I'd imagine I haven't done either, but how do you reconcile those two? Oh. And have you ever explored uh, using psychedelics for the purpose of spiritual enhancement? Oh, yeah. Well, let's, in a sense, that's what part of what the path I was on. Um, between 14 and 18, I was, I was, I was using LSD as a, scient as a, as a psychedelic. Um, it's a dangerous path, psychedelics. I think P I, I don't. I had incredible experiences, um, like I say, but yeah, the ultimate experiences I've had have been outside of psychedelics. I used a lot of psychedelics. I were, it wasn't just one or two experiences; as it was a lot. And I was, but I was very young, and I, did, you know, my brain and emotion system were not well formed because I had all of this anger and unresolved sort of emotional dysfunction. I'd, I'd say. And what tends to happen with psychedelics, those get brought up to the surface. And if you don't have good support, it can actually make psychological um, issues more pronounced and more, um, and create, in a sense, create more dysfunction. Yeah, I believe people could use psychedelics as part of a spiritual practice, but it has to be done very carefully. And usually with ayahuasca and things like that, there are guides there is they create a sort of cultural setting in which people can deal with some of the things that come to the surface and in a yeah. sense in a sense that's really what happened with me through that experience is is that that was actually a psychedelic experience that had caused this full-on psychosis to come and right. ultimately at the end of it i ended up having this very spiritual experience that sort of released me from a lot of the um, problems I was having. But at that point, the psychedelics had all worn off and I was just in this sort of messed up state. So, I mean, look, this is a very interesting topic. And, and I think you're right. I think a lot of um, people, um, just as in my, in my youth, a lot of people were using psychedelics, seeking to find some sort of spiritual connection with life. And because it helps to sort of break through Sort of patterns of consciousness that are that are ingrained, I guess. So I was very much on that path, but I didn't. I was sort of doing it by myself, and I think that's quite a dangerous thing to do. And like I did a lot of things, especially when I was young, I tended to take them to the extreme and push them to very risky places. And I think uh, that's why I ended up with such an extreme sort of um, breakdown, really. But ultimately, I mean, I was able to come out of it. Um, undamaged but look a lot of my friends and people who had really got into psychedelics um, like psychedelics were really common in the 70s when I was in my teens 
LSD was pre- nearly everybody took it. I mean, Paul McCartney in like 1967 basically said everybody should take LSD. Right. Yeah, it was it went really mainstream. And the reason why it didn't stay mainstream is a lot of people had very negative experiences because they experimented with psychedelics without sort of understanding the the dangers around it and, and for them psychologically. And um, it was a sort of very naive approach to say, oh, just drop acid and, you know, and you'll end up enlightened, sort of just incredibly naive. But look, it was all new. It was just new, like a lot of things that came up in the 70s, like free love and just just crazy stuff that young people were experimenting with. And I was very much involved in all of that. A lot of it, the dream turned into a nightmare. A lot of it, by the end of the 70s, there was just a huge number of young people addicted to heroin because heroin's the ultimate anti-psychotic. If you've, you know, had really psychotic experiences, one of the best things for calming it down is uh, opiate drugs. And so what ended up, yeah, is, is that heroin was really common. Like when I came to Australia in 1979, I think... Hawke was the prime minister. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think so. And his daughter got addicted to heroin. That's how common heroin had become in Australia by the end of the 70s. Mm. It, like that whole experimentation and psychedelics and, and just breaking down this sort of belief if we just broke down all the conventions and just had free love and just took acid and did what we felt like. It was sort of, it created a sort of social breakdown that we're still actually suffering the consequences of yeah Yeah. it's it's um well because you see not long after that that i mean it's the sort of belief that we can create some sort of social utopia if we just get rid of conventions and and um oh you know i there's just these very naive ideas out there in terms of um I mean, currently, a lot of those sort of 1970s things that were very, um, that turned out to be very damaging are sort of being sought to be brought in um, under sort of, I'd call it sort of wokeism or something like that. A lot of those ideas are just rehashes of the old hippie sort of naive sort of beliefs that we can somehow create society in unconventional ways and sort of ignore the sort of biology and psychology of actually who we are as human beings and and that somehow we can create some sort of egalitarian uh, utopia it's incredibly misinformed and it's and it's only possible to sort of think and believe that if you've got no understanding of the history of human culture and and how a lot of these things have been tried and, and totally failed before and okay they might be in slightly different new um, clothing, but it's the same old sort of slightly childish, naive ideas that just don't work in real life because they're based on a misunderstanding of who we are as humans. So what would you want to see instead? Well, I guess what, what I think there's a lot we can take from our heritage that's incredibly positive. And, and I think we should feel positive about human beings and their history that they that the enterprise of sort of human the human species is an incredible story of success just major success i think what what's tended to happen is is that we've arrived at a point where we're incredibly materially successful uh we've you know mastered a lot of elements of sort of natural reality and and through science and technology so that we can we can live incredibly sort of comfortable lives and materially rich lives but what the difficulty is is that we have we've tended to focus on and give the highest value to material um, returns and material goals but we haven't upgraded the software we have sort of upgraded the hardware of the world that we live in but we haven't upgraded the software, which is um, our belief systems, emotional connection with ourselves, sort of nature, in a sort of healthy way. We've sort of overvalued the material and undervalued the sort of emotional and philosophical. And because of that, we're living sort of like in a gilded cage. We're sort of trapped inside this amazing, beautiful, uh, you know, very uh, abundant 
human culture, but a lot of people are very lonely and and are very sort of unsatisfied. Um, and they're carrying sort of psychological dysfunction, emotional dysfunction. They, they lack ability to have long-term fulfilling relationships and um, lack a sense of purpose because of that. So they, they're sitting in their room or their nice house or whatever it is they've got, uh, or relatively nice yeah. compared to whenever you're comparing it to, they've got air conditioning. So when it's hot outside, they can make it perfect temperature. When it's cold outside, they can make a perfect temperature. Yeah. They've got cars to drive them to where they want to go. They've got technology. And in their hand, they've got technology that could only have been dreamed of uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago. It would be unimaginable yes. to be have that much computing power in your hands. And yet what so many people do is they go on social media trying to connect or they go elsewhere and they start trolling people and they they really kind of, they're trying to fill this void, which you were fortunate and unfortunate enough to notice that void yeah. when you were 14 and then fortunate enough to be able to break out of it when you were yeah. 18. But there are so many people who are still stuck there. What's the first step to get out of that rut? Well, I think the first step is just humility, is to just acknowledge that your life is less than what you want it to be and that maybe there's something I can learn. Maybe there's some um, key that will unlock this. And and really, the first step is to just seek to find whatever that key might be. And and I think I think that if nothing else in my life that... that that I can take from it is, is that when I've really sought for an answer, I've found it. And, and as long as I'm willing to then take those steps and apply sort of what's been revealed to me, um, it's taken me a step forward and sort of toward what I'm wanting and away from, you know, what I've realized I don't want. And, and it's just being in that state of humble enough to be teachable. And mm -hmm. And as long as we sort of believe that, well, I think there's two traps. One is the trap that we think we already know, and that's that's a cage that we can't get out of until we stop deluding ourselves. And the other is is the belief that there there isn't an answer that that you know I can seek and and I won't find. And that's that's a trap as well because in doing that, you know, you're literally locking the door on yourself and trapping yourself. So. That's and that's the beautiful thing. Wherever we might be, whatever you know, background or, or situation we're coming from, and whatever we might be seeking towards, as long as we're um, we choose to sort of step onto that pathway of just seeking an answer and and being humble enough to be open to listen and open to be aware of what life might be teaching us, then it, some something will show up that'll be a step forward for you. Mm. And that might be a person, it might be a, you know, a, something that you read, it might be, uh, and you'll have a sense that, oh yeah, this, this seems to be um, in alignment with where I'm wanting to go. And just mm. having the courage to take the steps. Okay, so let's explore some more of your steps. So you finished university in yes. Sydney. And then where to from there? Oh, what it was happened? amazing. I, Diane, <clears throat> Di I'd met Diane in 1979, six months after I arrived in Sydney. I think two years later, we moved up to a property that she was a, a um, partner in. This is another 1970s thing, is that people would buy land together and so she had a sixth share of a thousand acres uh, in northern New South Wales, it was ex state forest, and they'd bought it for twenty dollars an acre. Yeah, prices have yes. gone up, eh? Hey? Yeah. <laughs> so bad. she was able to pay that off while she was a student nurse. Mm -hmm. The uh, it was financed by the owner, and I, yeah. So anyway, we had decided we'd gone up on holiday and we decided to go and live in this in the midst of this forest and the idea is we'd, we'd build a house there and um, sort of start our lives there our sort of uh, that was not uncommon back then so it was very very alternative lifestyle sort of hippie thing 
Mm -hmm. And it was the most beautiful place I've ever lived in my life. It was an incredible experience. And we we lived there for eight months. And, and I had a very sort of spiritual experience there as well. And I realized that I didn't want to live in the forest and that I actually wanted to be um, sort of connected to society. And, uh, and so, yeah, we ended up moving to Lismore, the town of Lismore. And while we were living there, um, our first son was born. And that was an incredible experience. Two years later, we moved to New Zealand. And uh, shortly after that, our second son was born. And um, another two years later, our third son was born. So we went through this period of producing sons together, Diane and I. <laughs> and um, I, I ended up working at uh, starting a design company in Auckland. So we were living in Auckland, New Zealand. I started to design company there and a few years later i was lecturing at the university teaching interior design and uh, i did that for a few years and then my wife and i started a design company together because i had to commute commute to the university and we were living sort of would have it was like 45 minute drive away and i loved teaching but i was getting home sort of late and my kids these three children and a wife totally sort of dependent on me and I was way too much because I was also working as a um, designer in the city as well so so we decided I'd make a um well what Diane and I would make a design company together because she she had trained as an artist so yeah we started we'd we had actually I'd built a house I designed and built a house myself <laughs> when I was 32 I decided I we'd been looking to buy a place and we couldn't find what we wanted so we found a section and I designed a house and I had a couple of carpenters help me for six weeks putting up the frame of it and then I just built out all the all the interior so that was a really great experience was building a house for my designing and building a house for my uh, family yeah it was amazing and we sort of designed it so I could have a business we could have, there was a design studio in the the back of the house and so I was able to run a business from out of um, my home and be there um, far more and you know be around and how, how many how many years did you do that so how many years did you do that business while you're at home and you made that shift I, I resonate with the shift by the way because my wife and I made a very similar decision instead of me commuting to the city all the time uh, and doing something which I didn't completely love let's say uh, sell, selling selling products to high net worth yeah. clients wasn't wasn't exactly my calling, uh, and yeah, you make this shift and it's scary at the time and it's exciting and you got to have faith in yourself. But you had that faith in yourself and you took action and you did it and it became successful. Yeah, yeah, well. it was it was it was wonderful because Diane and I could work together, which was really great. She's a such a gifted. Um, artist and designer and um, and my sons could help in different ways you know and they could see what a creative enterprise looked like they could watch me you know start with say a drawing or something like that and then see me um, see me build something create a piece of custom furniture or um, they'd come on site and see a home that I was designing the interiors of and then they'd see it transformed and that helped me with different aspects of it so they just grew up just watching creative enterprise happening at home and seeing Diane and I working together and it was all just an organic part of just this is what family life's like it's a sort of it's a shared creative enterprise sort of thing. That was a beautiful time. That was such a fun time when my sons were really young. And then because my sons are a bit like Diane and I, they're very creative. They didn't like school. They didn't enjoy school. And the schools available in the area where we lived weren't, um, none of them sort of really aligned with what we, what we felt would, would work for them. We ended up taking our kids out of school and we actually homeschooled our three sons from right up through high school along with sort of running this design company, which um, we ran for the next, yeah, must have been 20 years, probably 15, 20 years. I can't remember exactly. How did you make that decision to, because there's three boys yeah. and like that, that, that could be a very chaotic household. And most people are very excited for school because it's like, okay, get, get the kids away. Uh, they can go there and then I can really focus on what I've got to do and then I'll give them my full attention later. Yeah. 
and you've been deciding to kind of split your attention, not in terms of hours on end between work versus family. It was throughout the whole day, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very integrated family and business, but that was when they were very young. The, how it worked is that um, we did send them to school. There was a local school they went to and we could just sort of see that they were going backwards because we'd, you know, they could read very early and they were all really gifted at art, like Diane and I, very creatively oriented. And they just, it just, the world of school just did not, just didn't work with them. This sort of conforming sort of um, pedestrian sort of approach to learning. They'd already experienced this very sort of dynamic learning environment of our home where there was high levels of creativity and so on. I think in a sense, we sort of set them up to fail at school because they'd already experienced learning as a really super fascinating, super um, challenging thing at home. So they would, weren't happy at school. And so, yeah, we ended, and see, Diane and I hadn't enjoyed school and we didn't want to put our kids through the experience that we really didn't enjoy ourselves. We weren't going to do that to our children. So yeah, we ended, Diane decided that she was willing to take on that role and she, which she did for the next you know, 10 years and did an incredible yeah. job. She took it on very sort of professionally, pretty much that mm -hmm. and being a mother was just a full-time activity. And she's, I mean, she still helped me occasionally in the design business, but Primarily, she was teaching my sons, and uh, so yeah, we've had a very we've had a very um, unconventional approach to things. I I, I I keep being I continue to be tempted to homeschool my daughter, mm. and I've got the flexibility within business that I could do it and just work at night and just kind of make it happen somehow. She's only two years old right now, yeah, um, but. I, the concern I've got, this is more of a question for you. Concern I've got is that uh, going to school seems like such a foundational experience of being able to connect with society or with community. Because no matter where you are in the world, almost everyone goes to school, even, even in developing countries, especially in the developed world. Uh, almost everyone goes to school. Mm. And it's kind of this core thing. Like when you meet someone at university or in, or even at work, it's like, where do you go to school? Or they talk about something from school. And if your only reference to it is uh, watching Hollywood movies, <laughs> then, then you might have a limited experience of life because of that limit, that, that limitation of being able to connect with others based on a common experience. How's that presented for your sons? And did you have that fear earlier on as well? Oh, I, I think that that's probably one of the things that stopped us from doing it initially because we thought about it and and um, and that's a real, I think that's, there, there's a sound basis to that concern because, but what we found is, is that the homeschooling community, that is actually a community. And so instead of it being the school community, it becomes this sort of homeschooling community. And in a place like Sydney, it would be amazing. It would be a homeschooling community that you, you and your daughter could connect into that's, um, and they could have like schooling type experiences doing specialist um, study around whatever astronomy or, you know, the homeschooling community are incredibly fascinating people and, and they'll create these interesting schooling type experiences. Yeah, really positive and it's just a different path to take. And, and with my sons, they all, like my sons have got no educational qualifications whatsoever because they chose not to. I actually, one of my sons, I think got a one music theory qualification for um, HSC level music, which he passed. He did it by correspondence. There's a correspondence school in New Zealand that you can use. And we really encouraged them to go to university and they all chose not to go. Mm -hmm. And they've all just chosen to have a career as musicians. They're all just been, they're all, because I taught them music as part of the homeschooling, mm -hmm. taught them piano. And then um, they ended up having, creating a, a sort of rock band together, the three, my three sons. And, right. and they ended up, we ended up sort of touring around the world together and them having sort of number one 
songs on the Australian <laughs> chart and playing to crowds of, I, I can remember standing in the crowd at um, Big Day Out in Sydney and they were playing on the main stage singing a song that was the number one song in Australia at the time and the whole crowd was singing the song uh, with them and that that's just something that my sons and I did together as sort of part of us just taking education in an unconventional pathway. It must have made you a very proud dad. <laughs> yeah, it was it was incredible. It was just sort of a dream fulfilled. Yeah, when they were young, I could see the potential of them playing together because they all just seemed very gifted musically. And um, and so all I did was just provide the the opportunities and and. Uh, over time, we got together the instruments and, and um, they ended up going in a competition, a high school rock band competition in New Zealand called the Rock Quest. And that was like a nationwide high school competition that was on television, sort of prime time television in New Zealand. And uh, like 600 bands from different high schools all around New Zealand entered. And they, um, they ended up winning the whole thing and winning $10,000 first prize and getting a recording opportunity to record and various things and off the back of that they then decided okay we're just gonna we're just gonna do music and so so they did that we did that for the next 10 years and that was pretty much my full-time job was sort of helping manage that enterprise together okay so design design business yeah then switch to band manager yeah. for your yeah. for your sons and the music business then- yeah in the music business. And then when did you eventually transition to coaching? Well, I really, when that finished, we all sort of decided that when they were in their late twenties and they'd lived this lifestyle of lots of touring and, and just going in the cycle of producing albums and touring, and they actually wanted to have a normal lifestyle. We all decided that, you know, it was time to just let it go and they could all have their own individual careers and go their separate pathways because we'd all sort of been living in each other's pockets because we were in business together and it was it was really intense for a, for a long time and it was super fulfilling and an incredible experience but you can, it wasn't sustainable we needed to um, create something and so so basically after that I decided I wanted to um, take on a role mentoring other people in creative enterprises some of my first clients were actually just business people and other coaches and I've I've ended up specializing specific particularly in terms of supporting creative people and business people around building fulfilling relationships because often that's the area often the people can be very successful in their business life and and in their career but often they haven't made the investments in terms of their relationship skills and I think the culture we live in now is very hard on relationships i think there's a lot of misunderstanding people misunderstand themselves they misunderstand other people and find themselves um, isolated or in conflict with with people who they care about and would love to have really harmonious relationships with but they sort of lack the tool set and the sort of necessary perspectives to um to move it into this place of, of sort of mutual respect and harmony. And that's been my primary um, focus. Yeah, like I say, that's where I see people struggling the most. So tell, tell me more about that. How are people struggling and how do you help them? Well, there are a lot of different... Um, I think the, the core problem that pretty much everybody struggles with is their relationship with themselves. Because the our relationship with ourselves is the foundation for all of our other relationships. And, and in a similar way, people see relationships as this thing that I have with other people. And they haven't taken the time to understand who they themselves are to then um, know what the most, um, what the best expression of themselves might be. Because we can't really express ourselves in the best possible way if we don't fully understand who we who we are to begin with. Mm-hmm. So if we're misunderstanding ourselves, we're bound to be misunderstanding everybody else. And and that's that's really our whole culture is sort of, in a sense, lacking self-awareness and lacking um, self-understanding and lacking self-compassion because um, 
when we become self-aware, we realize we actually really need self-compassion because mm. we, re- you know, when we look into ourselves, we see not only our strengths, but we see our flaws and our weaknesses and our, and yes. our inconsistencies, our hypocrisies and, and our contradictions. And, and so we have to be able to look at ourselves kindly and compassionately and generously so that we can um, patiently start to make adjustments and uh, sort of make upgrades in terms of uh, our skills and our um, just our ability to connect with others. Okay. And so self-compassion, self-awareness, and how do we do that? What's the best way to actually uh, foster self-compassion and to be able to look at our flaws kindly and compassionately and generously? Well, in a sense, if we could, in a sense, if we could sort of treat ourselves and look upon ourselves as if we were our own best friend. So imagine we create this sort of best friend of ourselves, who really has our best interests at heart who's kind but sort of firm and and not swayed from what's truthful and honest whereby we can sort of so rather than being a sort of a harsh judge of ourselves going oh look you've screwed up there what an idiot you know which is not helpful that does not bring about behavioral change all that does is create pain but- it creates pain. It, it does change our behavior, but not in the ways we want, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, in a sense, then we feel like we've got to escape because it's the pain builds up, and there's a point where I've got to sort of release this. I've got to find a way to numb it, and then we'll have some escape strategy, and that could be it could be alcohol, it could be some sort of addiction of one sort or another, that just provides a sort of release from just continually being hard on ourselves, and then we can. Whereas a, a, a really good friend would be going, would be just picking out the most important issue that needs to be dealt with and just saying, hey, maybe you should just do something about this because this will make the biggest difference for you. And then, okay, what do we need to, you know, what, to, what don't I know about this? What, what's missing here? And just start to work through making progress in the, in the areas that are going to bring the... the, the um, the, the most positive change. Okay, so the majority of your coaching from what you're sharing really focuses on identifying where our flaws are in a compassionate way and then identifying the, the behaviors which we need to change and to be able to be kind and firm with ourselves. And from having the self-awareness, we're able to make those changes quite easily. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, if the, having the self-awareness means, okay, when we know when we know what needs to be upgraded, we can then start looking for solutions around that. What's, you know, if this isn't working for me, you know, what might be a better approach? And when we ask the question, you know, we start to get some options and we and we can look around and find, it's just this journey of learning. Of and uh, But it need, we need to create this sort of um, compassionate learning environment. It can't just be, being hard on ourselves and punishing ourselves when you know when we fall short because we won't want to stay in it we'll want to get out of there and and forget because there's pain associated with the lessons whereas as if it's just something that's compassionate and i think for it to work we need to have a clear idea of where what we're aiming for what are going to be the rewards if we can make positive changes. And so being clear about what we're aiming towards, being clear about what it is we really want, and then if we're having to make sacrifices or we're having to do some work um, as being steps on this path, if we can see that the steps that we're taking is taking us in the direction of moving towards what we really want, emotionally we have the energy, we're able to bring that emotional energy of the sense of moving towards where I want to go, to the work that we that needs to be done but if we're not clear about where we're going and what it is we really want it's really hard to justify to ourselves the work that needs to be done taking the time to get really clear about what it is you want is super important and one, and then it's then a matter of seeing the gap between what you really want and where you are now and then just take making having a sort of uh, a progressive set of steps between the two and and it's 
it's sort of creative problem solving and and mm -hmm. see that as a creative uh, process and enjoy the um, the path because I the thing is is that if if you know you're on the path towards uh, moving towards where you want really want to go there's just this sense of fulfillment and simply being on the path we don't have to get there it's just simply that we're on that path it energizes us to do the work uh, one part which you just mentioned there which is which I want to dive into a little bit more yes you said you want to try and learn without the pain because the pain stops us from learning. Do you would you like to expand on that? Well, the thing is, is that if we, are, if we, if we're too hard on ourselves, if we just punish ourselves for every little way that we're um, falling short, and we always will fall short. The, the fact is, is if we're really honest, we never do anything perfectly. There's always some aspect that isn't that we could have done a little better, because that's just the truth of life. There's no no perfection here there's an ideal that we can aim for, but we're never going to fulfill it. And we have to be completely okay with that. But at the same time, we want to be motivated to keep moving. And so so being able to be honest with ourselves that, okay, I fell short in this particular area, and you know I'd like to do that better and get a better outcome. Instead of that being a painful process of just punishing ourselves for the part that wasn't quite right, we need to be able to... Um, in a sense, enjoy the learning experience, feel good about it, and go and go. Okay, that was less than less than ideal. And actually, I think the key to this, and this is such a key understanding, is separating our actions from our person. So when we do anything that's less than ideal, sure, okay, our action was less than ideal, but that does not diminish our core worth as a person. So we can still feel that I'm, you know, I'm a wonderful, amazing, unique person, and nothing's ever going to change that. I always, I always was, I am, and I always will be a wonderful, unique, ama amazing person. And sure, all my actions, no matter how well I do them, there'll be aspects of it that's less than ideal. And that's cool. That's fine, and I can be honest with it, myself about that. But that does not diminish my core worth. And so if, if my core worth is not diminished by imperfect actions then i'm i'm able to be completely honest with myself and be in this creative process of oh yeah i can do this better but i still feel great about myself and you know and whether i get ex acceptance or uh, accolades from other people doesn't change my core worth i always was an amazing wonderful person uh, sure it's a nice bonus if people recognize when we've done something well that's that's nice but that's so flaky that's so fickle it's not it's going to vary sometimes you might think oh that wasn't that good and that's the very thing that people go oh that was really good and other things so it's and and other things that you know that that was good work that you did and for whatever reason there's no recognition for it you, you just that's the nature of the world that's the nature of you know, some of just looking at, say, music, you know, some of the greatest albums of all time at the time were, were a flop. They were a financial seen as a failure. But over time, they became seen as incredible, great art. And people 50 years later are being inspired and, and enlivened by these things that, that these artists created. So we can't be over, we can't be attached to other people's responses to things that we do. We need a sort of way of be able to look at what we do and assess it and and get feedback from maybe people we trust their opinion but always knowing that their opinion their perspective isn't you know it's just their perspective it's useful and often we can get wisdom and insight from others opinions on things we might have done but ultimately um whether their opinion's good or bad doesn't change our core worth and i think that's one of the keys to um being able to keep on that path of learning is that you can, whereby you're not overly affected by the successes and you're not overly affected by the failures. They're just all learning either way. They're just a learning, just mm -hmm. another step on the path. Yeah, it would be like on the, on the very simple aspect, it would be like studying for an exam and focusing on it and doing your best towards it, but really just enjoying the act of learning yeah. and gathering the knowledge and really 
really enjoying exploring this new perspective. And sure, the outcome which you're hoping for is 100% or whatever, but you don't ever expect 100%. And if you get 100%, if you get 90%, if you get 40%, great. There are things to learn from it and take that for the next part and move forward. Yeah, yeah. And and then I can, I've seen this as well. I, I love what you're saying because I can see it in people probably most dangerously as spouses, but even more so as parents. And then they begin to identify their, their sense of value or worth as to how great their children are. Mm. And then they're looking at whether or not their children are being successful in this area or this area or how soon is my kid walking? Mm, or yeah. can my kid count or oh my god that kid's saying mama like a month before <laughs> mine oh my god this is terrible right and i i see that showing up in people which is really scary because then they're saying no 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 the only way i'm going to be successful is, is if my child conforms to the version of success which i've created in my mind mm. and this is scary well at least it's scary to me do, do you see the same thing in our society Oh, I think that's so fascinating. I think your awareness of that particular thing is particularly because you've got this two-year-old child and that's mm. the world that you're in and, and you're, you're really perceiving that aspect. What I think is really interesting about that is that often our sense of worth and sense of um, value comes from those sort of confusing signals that are given to us when we're really young. And... Often that is incredibly dependent on the particular struggles that the parents are going through at the time and what their emotional needs at the time are as to whether that's a really positive, helpful input for the child or whether it's actually can be quite toxic and quite confusing. And, um, and the fact is, no matter how good a job we do as a parent, we it's, that's one of the perfect examples of no matter how well we might have done it or we're doing it, we could always do it better. It's, and, and, you know, and this poor child has got to put up with us doing this less than ideal job of parenting. And as a parent, if we really love the child, we're really aware of when it's not as ideal as it should be. And depending on the child, some child, children are more difficult than others and, and, and it's more of a challenge. But being honest about the fact that it's always going to be less than ideal and i think marriage is the same having unrealistic expectations about marriage and um, parenting just sets us up to um to not be in the best emotional state in terms of um learning and being able to um, adapt as we get feedback from um you know, what's going on inside the relationship, either with our partner or with our child. Look, that's the most challenging. Parenting and marriage are probably the most challenging things to make a, a real long-term success of in our lives. It's because you're dealing with individual people who've naturally got a slightly different perspective. And, and there's always going to be misunderstanding because yeah. their experience is completely different from yours. And um, at certain times, sure, we'll have real alignment and harmony and that's beautiful but that's that's not going to be permanent or or you know really lasting that will come and go and we've got and our expectations have to be realistic about that and in a sense that's what we should be expecting that i'm going to have to continue to adapt the way i relate to this person because this person is a growing person they they are actually going through changes so what might have worked in the past and it, there's going to be a point where that will break down and I'm going to have to adapt. I'm going to have to find a new way to connect and a new way to, um, you know, and just keep upgrading my skill set. And that's so, so, so there, there positive for us. This. Yeah. So there are two extremes that people could take from that, right? Like, I, yeah. and I'm playing a little bit devil's advocate. Yeah. But I love what you're sharing. The, the first part is one could say, well, if the growth that you can receive from being with someone who's changed or different is the best thing that you can possibly get from a relationship, then you should just end the relationship and find someone who's completely different, right? And then the other extreme is saying, well, why don't you find someone who just stays the same 
doesn't them changing actually mean it's bad because that's stopping you from learning and growing in other areas? And so the, this is devil's advocate because I yeah, don't no, believe that either of those are the attitude. best way to go. Yeah, and and the thing, the second attitude that you're going to find someone who's not going to change, that's that doesn't exist. I think first of all, because mm -hmm. you know people changing from their twenties into their thirties into their forties into their like literally the human body is just literally goes through physiological change, and that and and as far as emotion and and sort of mindset and so on that at a hormonal level there's huge changes especially in women women you know go through the biggest hormonal changes and that are through those different stages um because of the whole reproductive side of it there um so it's i mean men go through um changes all around you know what their expectations are in terms of um themselves and their situation uh just as they go through those different stages of life so it's change is inevitable that's just going to happen and so you've got two changing individuals inside a marriage that if it's a man and a woman they've got two different hormonal systems they're operating on a different sort of time frame they're inherently coming from different perspectives it's incredible like it's it's this incredible learning experience and and growth um potential growth environment if you can choose to stick with one another and learn from each other you're going to enrich each other and enlarge you know your perspective and experience of life for each other but you've got to be willing to be open to that sort of learning and that sort of growth otherwise the change is going to be um, what's un feel unstable it's going to feel if you don't embrace the change it's just going to feel like instability and and chaos when really there is a pattern to it, it's not chaos, there's actually a pattern to it, it's just often we don't understand all the reasons why that change is coming. And some of it's just physiological and hormonal and stuff like that, that's sort of um, invisible. And, um, you know, and you're living separate lives and so that you're getting different inputs. And so inevitably that's going to show up as, as, you know, things transforming and changing. And so... What I'm hearing from you is just saying, just embrace the change. Yeah, um, it's all learning. See, it's all about enlarging, you know, and enriching your life. If you can look for the gold, you know, it's sort of like, like there's this trail of gold that runs through our life. And it, it's always there. And there's all these sort of rocks and things there as well, and things that look like gold. But there's actual real gold just sitting there waiting to be um, discovered, but you've got to be willing to do the mining. And, and you know, if you expect the gold's just going to be sitting there waiting for you to pick it up, it's, that's not how it's going to be. You've got to do the work. You've got to be willing to separate the, the gold, for, you know, or the potential gold and then, and then separate just all the just random rubbish that gets in the way of finding it and and then when you find the gold you need to store it up when you find wisdom you need to store it up you need to treat it as valuable and have sort of like a sort of treasure box where the things that you discover that's that are of real lasting value you need to recognize them as that and put it in a place whereby you get to keep it and it's there and it's valuable and it's going to continue to enrich your life you know for the for the rest of your life and then you can at different times you can bring it out when you feel like the opportunity you can bring it out and you can share some of that uh you know with people who are you, you feel are open to it and you can enrich their lives and that can mm. just be a really beautiful connection and they'll and and if you do that they'll might then trust you and be willing to bring out their real wonderful lasting things that they've discovered and whereby you enrich each other and you know and you create this deep trust connection around things of real lasting value and that are you know really fulfilling that's just such a and in a sense the, a marriage is a space where that is possible because you've got this committed long-term relationship and also as a parent um, it's possible whereby you bring out this, you know, these insights and these wisdoms and obviously at, 
at varying degrees of complexity for the child. But the thing is with the child is is that it's only a sort of short-term thing. That period of you having this relationship when the child is so open to you, it, it comes and then it passes away. It's gone. Mm. And sure, you can then have a, a relationship with them as adults, but that's a different relationship. That's a more equal thing and, and that's a more you know, egalitarian thing. Whereas this parent-child thing is this a magical, you're the sort of guru and they're the apprentice. You know, that's, that's this magical space. And um, it's so beautiful and so f- super fulfilling. But you've really got to be able to um, embrace the, the chaotic elements of that because a child being very open, they're open to all sorts of crap. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all over the and, place. And, and they're also going to be very resistant to things as soon as, yeah. like as soon as you chip away something that just like with what your parents are sending you to boarding yeah. school. And then suddenly you you no longer held them in such high regard yeah. as you did before. Yeah, and, so, and they're going to test everything. They're going to test everything. You might say this is a lasting value, and they'll go, they'll smash it with a hammer and see, you know, and see if it really is. Yeah. And but in a sense, that's showing that they actually are wanting something like that. But they they. There's just this inherent um, need to test things, and and mm. that's healthy. And so, so possibly one of my last question, possibly my my last question before we do a bit of a wrap up, yes, is you've you've mentioned relationships come and go, yes, and in today's society, divorce, separation, um, and not even committing to a relationship long term in the first place uh, is more and more common and more and more prevalent. And so where do we where do we draw the line between saying this is one of the things that comes up most in coaching conversations whenever a relationship comes up. What are one that how can we identify for ourselves where uh, when it's no longer worthwhile mining for the gold where you are versus going somewhere else to mine the gold? Or is it always best to just mine the gold where you are because there's gold in everything? And at what point are you going to recognize that there's diminishing returns compared to elsewhere? Yeah, I think that's a that's a huge question. That's a really, really big question because every marriage is different because every two individual people are different. And it's really hard to have a single answer for that. I think it just goes back to the seek and you'll find is is that it's you've got to be willing to look upon your situation honestly. You might be hurting. Something that your partner might have said or done might be have been really, really hurtful. And you're angry about that. And you feel wounded by it. And the difficulty is that it's really hard to make good decisions in that state. Literally, what happens is when we're emotionally um, in an emotionally um, triggered state, it shuts down the front part of our brain, the, the um, prefrontal cortex, where our sort of decision-making um, is centered. And, and the difficulty is, is then we'll, it'll be more of a reaction to a circumstance or a, a situation than actually a really good decision. And often our, the whole rest of our life, the shape of the whole rest of our life can be determined by decisions we make in, the, in a time of just being reactive. And um, it's just that who you're married to, who you choose to spend your life with, is like it's probably the biggest decision you make in your whole life. It determines the quality of your life the most. And so it's important that you don't, you know, react out of hurt or or bitterness. And often people are carrying baggage from their childhood or carrying baggage from previous relationships. 
that's that is so um, strong, um, and it's being triggered by whatever ca- the current situation is, and they can't even really see the current situation clearly because of the the filters of their previous experience. And so my suggestion is is I'd get someone involved who's independent, who's skilled at helping to clarify what might actually really be going on and what the the actual real options are and my suggestion is there's not a lawyer <laughs> who's, who's as soon as you've got a lawyer involved it's probably too late i mean right? look they can't help it but they're incentivized the, the financial is incentivist towards dissolution of the relationship it would be very unwise to get someone involved who's you know who isn't that's not an independent unbiased situation you need to get someone involved and the difficulty is is friends and family they've all got a sort of they've all got a stake in the whole situation and so it's unlikely you're actually going to get really independent inside so i'd suggest you seek to find someone that'll help you get some perspective on it who has experience in that space because it's a minefield it's a minefield uh, legally financially um, emotionally um, and if there are children involved it's you know it's a lifelong minefield that you know that the chances of not stepping on a mine and trying to navigate it is pretty minimal there are a few exceptions but it's it's you've got to you don't want to enter that unless you're absolutely sure and you've got a really good strategy and you've got good advice that's, that's... And I think that's a very I think that's a very powerful message you just shared is that no matter what your circumstances is, are, mm. you always have choices. And mm. sometimes you can't see the choices clearly because most people will make permanent decisions off the back of emotional uh, mm. of temporary emotions, right? And so I think that's a very it's a very well put and balanced response to I can't tell you if you should just commit is maybe you could trust your gut. Or maybe you should consider a whole bunch of other factors first and then trust your gut off the back of knowing what you actually need to know. Because most people, when they're in that state, they just want to get out and they don't care anymore. Like, they're just, I don't care. I'm speaking to the lawyer because, yes, it's going to dissolve. Like, I got to get out of this. Yeah, I, go, I want and... to get rid of the pain. But often the pain is actually not coming from their relationship. It's It's coming from just stuff that, happened way earlier in your life and and you're just projecting the current circumstance on top of what was already there and yes. and um and and you can exit that relationship but it'll show up in another way when in actual fact this situation might actually be an opportunity for you to deal with that stuff and get free of all of that and uh, maybe then once you're free of it you you might realize okay that this relationship isn't the right space for me to, to continue. Or it might be, oh, okay, oh, with this new perspective, I, actually I can see a path through whereby this whole situation can end up being a, a gain, not a loss. And often, to uh, be um, honest, so often with clients I've worked with, they, they've been able to turn, turn it around in a way that it's turned it out, ended up becoming a gain. And that, that sounds like you're your whole life journey uh, or from everything which you've described, like that's the core part of it, right? Is how can I take this moment to find what I can learn most from? And you even mentioned it. I think you used the terms, how can I be, uh, can I be teachable? Mm. Or how can I be teachable? Mm. What can I learn from this? How can I take this experience to be able to grow more? And whether that means you're growing more in the relationship you have now, whether it is permanent Mm. or temporary, whatever, or if you're applying it to, the, your current job, which mm. is usually going to be temporary because that's going to change yes, even if it it's is. your own business. That's yeah. likely to change too. And so how can you take the learnings from those experiences and apply it to yourself, that take that gold and mm. clean it and store it and nurture it and take care of it and allow it to enrich the lives of others? Yeah. And that, that's a beautiful message. So what, what I might do quickly is... Just give a bit of a rundown of what I've heard you share, and then that gives you the opportunity to share anything which I might have missed or clarify something which I might have heard the wrong way. So we really started looking at how you define success. And 
I think that your response to it was along the lines of being able to sustainably live a fulfilling life across all the different important sectors of our lives. Yeah. So the social, business, impact, how to continue to be productive. And I think you used the term increase in the world. And you want it to be healthy and sustainable and rewarding. Mm. And it's going to be, there's this natural element to each person. Uh, but there's also elements of our culture and the people who are always around us, whether that's at school or our parents, or if it's our siblings or our friends, yeah. uh, or if it's the TVs, we, the movies we watch on TV, whatever it is. And so we need a support base of great relationships. And you said that doesn't have to be a particular person. It can be in books or it can be uh, in various other mediums, say a podcast. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like I think nowadays podcasts are really important. Yes. And you, to further on that, you said you just got to find wisdom mm. and you got to build wisdom. And you said that was a tool set of practices that deliver fulfillment across all those different areas of your life. And you go along this pathway and you take wrong turns, wrong turns, mm. and you make mistakes and you had this incredible journey of from like from literally uh, drug dealer and drug addict, uh, teenage <laughs> teenage drug dealer. I'll call I'll call the episode that uh, to being able to have a beautiful marriage and raise these amazing kids who have already been wildly successful and they don't even have the creditations that everyone in society expects of them. And you've done a whole bunch of different businesses and you love what you're doing. And you said that the trap that most people fall into is when they're overly connecting their purpose to the specific goals. Mm. And that just leads to the trap of losing purpose as soon as those goals are achieved. Yes. And so it's not saying don't have goals. It's saying you need better goals. And you don't need to continue to have the limited views of the world uh, that's just so natural for young people to have. And while we didn't quite define what young people means, I'm going to... I'm going to assume that it's not just to teenage. Mm. I'm going to assume it continues until you're in your 20s and your 30s. Very much. And so we have this great opportunity. As soon as we start to learn more, we start to be able to identify who we are and kind of try and embrace these views to define what we really want in our own life. And because we can miss opportunities by focusing on those short-term goals, by just focusing on achieving them, rather than continue to step back and looking at really where we want to be. And you said that something for all of us is that we all want to do something positive and something significant. But what's positive and what's significant is going to be different for everyone. Mm, yeah. And so you had this amazing journey. You had a really supportive uh, home life, although it was a little bit too to the code and by the book. And the boarding school just really put you on a, on a completely different trajectory, which got you ultimately to where you are now, right? Yes. And we came back to that point of whether or not we're teachable. What can I learn from this? How can I prevent myself from falling into that trap again? And we spoke about the gilded cage, right? Yeah. And we need the, we need the humility to be able to step out of it. And so ultimately, we need to be able to admit to ourselves our life isn't exactly how we want it to be. And that's okay. But let's move forward from here because mm. as soon as you can accept that, then you can work out where you want to go. And so you started your own design business, you built your own house, you homeschooled your children, you were a band manager for your sons. And then when they got to the late 20s and they needed to go in their individual careers, you decided it was time for you to do it as well. Mentoring others in creative enterprises and now focusing on the relationships in people's lives. Because, and, and you shared some amazing things that, uh, our culture's hard on relationships, and ultimately that's because we're being hard on ourselves. And we need self-compassion whenever we're looking at our flaws. And you said you said these three words which stuck with me. You said you we need to look at them at ourselves kindly, compassionately, and generously to be able to patiently make the adjustments that we need in our life. And ultimately to be our best friend without the mm. judgment. And there's always this, this kind of trade-off between the long-term gain and the gold we can find from mining deep versus the short-term change which we can possibly make. And we'll usually find more gold when we're focused on the long-term rather than just making short-term decisions always. Because as you said, we're always going to fall short of perfect. We can always do better. 
and we just need to separate our actions and our results from our core worth as a person. Like, yeah, it can be great to get accolades, but if you're just doing something for the accolades, it's always going to feel that empty. As soon as like, yes, I was successful. Amazing. Look at me. I've made all this money. And then, okay, how happy are you in another week or another month or another year? Is it still there or is it missing? In which case, it's not associated with our core worth. There's something else that's there. And so those, those are the key messages I've received from you throughout this conversation. <laughs> is there anything which you'd like to really add to or adjust or correct? Uh, and is there anything else which you really want to share to the listeners who have stuck with us for almost two hours? Yeah. Oh, look, uh, first of all, I'm amazed at your ability <laughs> to, to take in and retain so much. Uh, look, you're... No, I feel like what you've shared is covers... Oh, I mean, what an amazing journey this couple of hours has been just going through. You, you've been going... You've been mining, <laughs> looking for gold. <laughs> you really have. And sifting and, and so on. But, no, I think... I think um, I think we've covered a lot of really important issues and and if people can find value in amongst what we've covered uh, and look to just apply it in just simple uh, practical ways in their life, I think that they'll find that they'll there'll be a return on on those efforts. So, so if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, okay, I'm going to set some time aside to really to really work on myself, and I need to ask myself a question. What question would you encourage them to meditate on, or be mindful of, or think about, and try and answer? Probably something like, in five years from now, what what would my I like my life to look like? I just allow yourself to dream and uh, unencumbered by your current circumstances. And I think there's the potential if you're willing to do that um, and just make a note of what, just journal it out, write it out as it unfolds. And in it, you'll, you'll probably get a picture of who, who you potentially can be and what your deep desires are but also you can then reverse engineer from that and and start to build steps to take you towards what it is that you're really wanting mm. and there's the gold right there mm. thank you Martin. oh no that's been great it's been a wonderful conversation harry i've really enjoyed this I hope you enjoyed this episode of Success with Purpose and I also hope that you feel capable to apply some of the perspectives and learnings from this episode in your own life. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe below. And until next time, live with purpose.